Welcome. We're thrilled that so many people are joining us today for this very important arts and culture event presented by Dave Iverson on the challenges and lessons of caregiving. Dave, we're honored you're joining us. Some of you may be very familiar with Ashby Village, some may not be. We're a nonprofit organization in the East Bay that's composed of a creative and determined network of people who support each other to age in community with vibrancy, independence, and purpose. We have about 400 members, 300 volunteers of all ages, and a dedicated community of partners and supporters. If you haven't already, I invite you to become a member or a volunteer you'll be glad that you did. We're happy to present these kinds of programs and this quality of programming free of charge, so it's accessible to everyone. If you're able to support our ability to offer free programming, we invite you to donate to Ashby Village. You can see a link in the chat for where to donate. Next, I'm turning it over to Joanne Carter, an inspiring Ashby Village member who will introduce Dave Iverson. We have Joanne to thank for inviting Dave, whom she worked with when she served as the Vice President of Human Resources and Labor Relations at KQED. I also wanna acknowledge, Joanne, your impactful work in Ashby Village's Client Climate Action Task Force and your commitment throughout the pandemic as a phone friend to 16 isolated members. All right, Joanne, take it away. Okay, well, I just want to, before we really get started and I introduce Ron and Dave, I want to tell a story to, to explain how this all happened today. About two months ago, an old friend of mine who happened to be a former commentator on the news hour called me and said, you know, uh, do you remember a Dave Iverson? And I said, yeah, I do. Uh, he was downstairs in radio and I was up there in HR. And I do remember that it, he ultimately left and went to the Mo Michael J. Fox Foundation. And so anyway, she said, well, you know, he has written a book and I've read it. She said, I've read it. And she said, I, I really loved it. But she said, you know, he'll need some help getting it out there and getting the word out. And she said, you know, I know you're a member of Ashby Village. And I thought that maybe you could introduce him there. And so I said, well, sure, you know, give me his phone number. And so she did. And I called Dave and uh, we talked and he sent me his book. So I read it on my Berkeley porch a couple of days later. And, you know, it's, it's a wonderful book. Uh, but also, I just want to comment from a personal point of view that it reminded me personally of my own experiences. My father died of Alzheimer's many, many years ago and my mother and what she went through and the caregivers that helped her. And then almost 25 years later, my mother at 95 had ovarian cancer. And I was working at KQED and I couldn't find, I couldn't take time off. So I found a wonderful caregiver who actually moved in to the house and stayed with her and actually found one other. And I not only found that it was so helpful for my mom, but it was also a friendship that I developed over that year with those women. So I, I just, just wanted to point out that memory before I introduce both of them. So now let me talk about Dave and um, Ron, but I'll start with Ron. Um, as I understand it, Ron is currently the senior editor and correspondent for at the Washington DC desk for the NPR. And he also is a lecturer at American University. And I also understand that he is, and I had forgotten this, that he is the voice on the Saturday uh, news, news edition with Simon, uh, with Scott Simon, excuse me. So, and incidentally, he did remind me that he had met Dave's mother some years ago. So I don't really have a lot to say about Dave because, you know, I think you've all heard him before. Many of you have read his book, but I will say that he started at Wisconsin Public Radio and from there came to KQED. And during those years, he did a number of documentaries, which were award-winning. And while at KQED, he was also one of the hosts of Forum. 
So without saying anything more, I'm going to introduce both Ron and Dave to you. Thank you so much, Joanne. It's always good to see people from the public radio mafia and know that we are everywhere and that all things are possible and making connections between public radio people. Uh, I am here today because I want to tell you how much this book has meant to me and other members of my family. Uh, I think we all have stories we could tell. My father lived to within three weeks of 100 and uh, the caregivers that he experienced in the later stages of his life became some of the most important people in his life. And I think that uh, I saw a lot of his experience in Dave's experience. And we're gonna talk about those caregivers and where they come from. We're gonna talk about those caregivers and what they're going to mean to us as a society and to many of us as individuals as time goes on. But we're gonna start, of course, with Dave and Adelaide and Bill Iverson. Bill Iverson was Dave's father and Adelaide's husband. And this story, this book really to me is a love story. It is first the story of Bill and Adelaide's wonderful World War II romance, World War II era romance. And it speaks, I think, to a lot of us in, in terms of other members of our family who have very similar stories to tell about separation and how the separation brought them closer together, made their bond stronger, made it last longer because they had been so much to each other and been so far apart for so long. And I, I'm gonna to try to prevail on Dave to read a couple of, of the letters between his folks, uh, their, their, his father's letters, and, and they really are quite marvelous. They're little, little gems. But uh, the first thing I wanna ask Dave to do is to give us the frame, give us the, the overall sort of picture of the Iverson saga, how, how his parents got together and then what his life was like with them. Thank you, Ron, and thanks everyone at Ashby Village and, and all of you for joining uh, Ron and, and me today. It's, it's uh, really wonderful to be able to be with you and to talk about this, um, this important um, topic because as, as Ron suggests, it's one that will, if, not, if it hasn't already, will affect all of us. We're all gonna either need care or provide care or probably perhaps uh, experience uh, both. So it's, it's truly a universal topic. And yet it's one that we don't talk about a lot. It's kind of a, a quiet crisis in some ways that we're facing in this country. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to talk about it today. And my parents were a great romance. Um, they met in, uh, uh, when they were both teaching at a, a Gross Point a Junior High School uh, in the late 1930s. My dad had dropped out of the uh, college during the depression because he was the only one who could support the family. And they, they met uh, and they, they became, became a bit of an item. And then of course, World War II happened. And my, my folks were, were not yet married, although they were a couple and were separated for a long period of time. And we'll return to that. But they were a, they were a great pair. Uh, but my dad had Parkinson's late in his life. And uh, my mom gave me really my first true example of caregiving. Um, and she was really a remarkable person, a real force of nature. And so what I'd like to do is just read a little bit from the prologue uh, to the story, to the book, uh, which says a little bit about my mom and about how I wound up being uh, someone who, who would care for her just as she had cared for my, my dad a number of years before. So this is an excerpt from the prologue to Winter Stars. My mom had always been a force. She'd graduated from high school at age 16, from college at 20, and at the top of her class in both. She'd been a teacher, a devoted spouse, a mother of three, a passionate sports fan, a loyal friend, and a powerhouse volunteer. When she was 94, she threw out the first pitch at a Stanford University baseball game. At 96, she made phone calls in her own distinctive style urging people to vote for Barack Obama. My mom was someone who didn't blink, confronting most challenges with a firm, no-nonsense demeanor. No one ever trifled with Adelaide Iverson, and that included me. After my dad passed away in 1994, my mom lived independently for 13 years, but at age 95, she'd had a difficult bout with pneumonia 
and couldn't manage fully on her own. I was a broadcaster and filmmaker living in nearby San Francisco at the time. My life was full, but flexible. And it really didn't take much deliberation for me to decide that it just made sense for me to move in and help. So with that, at the age of 59, I moved in with my mom. But of course, there was so much that I didn't know. I didn't know I'd become so exhausted. I didn't know I'd be capable of getting so angry. I didn't know I'd be tested in ways I'd never imagined or rewarded in ways I'd never dreamed. I didn't know I'd be joined by remarkable women caregivers who became my teachers, my comrades, and my kin. And I never imagined that after I moved back in, my mom would live for another full decade before passing away at the age of 105. Dave, talk a little bit about the, the, the testing that, that you mentioned a moment ago. Um, the way you found yourself having to meet challenges you probably had never imagined meeting yourself. Your, your mother had taken care of your dad, but now she was the one who needed the care. Talk a little yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, first I wanna say, and we'll return to this, I know Ron, that I had it good. I mean, I had it really about as good as any family caregiver can have it. By that, I mean, I had help. Um, I had these amazing women who we'll discuss who came in and were with my mom uh, throughout the day. So my duties began at night and then extended through the weekend. That may sound like a lot, and it was a lot, uh, but it's way better than most family caregivers have it. They don't get to walk out the front door in the morning and not come back until evening. I, I got to do that, and that made it much easier, I think, on me than on many. But sure, I, I just, you know, it didn't occur to me, for example, here's a small example, the caregivers actually have lives of their own, you know, so that if, if one of our caregivers was sick or one of their kids was sick, I'd get a call at seven in the morning saying, sorry, Dave, can't come today. And then everything's, it's like caregiving is a bit like a house of cards. It doesn't take much for it to come tumbling down. And so I quickly have to scurry and, and rearrange. I think it's also testing because it's so all encompassing. You know, you, you experience everything. My mom and I had wonderful, wonderful moments together. But we also had moments when we'd both be frustrated and annoyed with each other and angry. You get it all. You get love and loss. You get um, joy and, and anger. And you often get them when you're exhausted <laughs> and often on the same day. Um, so sleep was a huge challenge. Just you know, may, you may remember what it's like to get up with an infant, you know, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> and it's different when it's your, when your mom, all of those things add up. And I think the never ending nature of it, or what can feel like a never ending nature, um, can also take its toll. All those things are enormously challenging, but they're also incredible opportunities to learn, to grow, um, to be tested, which means you also have the opportunity to, to open up to maybe being a little bit better person. Um, so it's all of those things. How did all of this involve other members of your family? Your, your, your brother, uh, talk a little bit about your, your brother and his, his condition and, and some of the other members of your family, such as uh, uh, your aunt and so on, and other people who saw Adelaide were, were, were their lives in, in some sense or another disrupted as well? Not in quite the same way. Um, I, have two, I, I have two wonderful brothers. My older brother, Peter, um, sadly passed away last year due to complications of late stage Parkinson's. Um, but both my, my brother, Peter, and my younger brother, Paul, uh, we're facing real health challenges of their own. And so they couldn't play a role in the way that I did. And my brother, Peter was out of state. He was a retired history professor at Arizona State University, but they were enormously supportive, which actually means a lot, as were my sisters-in-law, as was my longtime partner, Lynn, the woman who is now my wife. So I had, I had great support, a lot 
you know, was on me to do, but I never felt all, all alone um, in, in quite the way that I think many, many caregivers often are. I was really lucky in that way. But, you know, it was hard to accept as far as the rest of the family goes, I think sometimes that, well, how could Adelaide ever be, you know, less than who she was? She was such a powerhouse and so businesslike in the way she took on things um, that I think it was hard to accept that she wouldn't always be that way. You'd think that by the time she was in her 90s, I would have thought to myself, you know, this can't go on forever. But I think we all sort of felt like, well, except for Adla, she will go on forever because, you know, she read the New York Times every day until she, she was over a hundred. She was, she read extensively. She watched television. She was a, you know, she, I used to joke, she watched two networks, ESPN and PBS, but you know, she was literally in the game. And so I think, I think it was hard for us to even imagine that this would be true. And when it became true, it was like, well, okay. And I think that's, unfortunately, that's the case caregivers often find themselves in. And as a nation, we find ourselves in. We don't think ahead enough about this inevitability. We don't think enough about the fact that in this country, every eight seconds, turns someone turns 65. So that by the end of our conversation today, there will be another 800 or so 65-year-olds than when we began. Um, you know, this, this is something we need to address. And I know we'll talk about that more too. Well, the expectation, the extraordinary expectation here is that, as you say, she would always be the same, that she would always be the matriarch and, and for example, lead the way for Christmas and all the rest of the holidays and be the person that organized things and so on. So when that was no longer possible, and you were her principal supporter, let us put it that way. Um, you had in one particular instance, an instance that I know you write about in, in the book that uh, was, was a trial because her behavior deteriorated. She was still herself in a way, but not her good self, not the self she would have been proud of. Talk a little bit about that in that particular yeah. instance. Yeah. Well, it's such a good point, Ron. I mean, I think one of the many things I learned is that dementia, which is what began happening to my mom in her late 90s, um, is not any one single thing. My mom could be startlingly insightful well past 100 and say these remarkably insightful things. Once when I was showing her, trying to show her pictures of um, her grandchildren on my laptop and the laptop remained dark for a long time. And she looked into the screen and she said, it's like looking into a dark river and not being able to see the fish. Well, you know, so, so she could, she could, but then sometimes she would just be cranky and confused and ornery and unhappy. And the moment you're describing was when we went out to my aunt's house for dinner, one for one family occasion. And my aunt, who is my dad's much younger sister, so she was almost 20 years younger than my folks, had taken over hosting family duties. And so we went out there and my mom was cranky from the get-go. She snapped at people. She would, people would say, well, what would you like Adelaide? And she would say, nothing that's here. Or, you know, she would just be angry and unhappy. And I remember finally walking over to her because I was tired and cranky because I hadn't been getting much sleep. And I said, if you don't act better, we're going home exactly as I would have to a four-year-old. But it kept up. And my aunt asked her a question about where she wanted to sit. My mom snapped at her and I said, that's it. We're going home. Marched her out of the house, into the car, drove home in silence. And when we got home, I walked her into her bedroom with, with hands as comforting as steel, is, is what I write. And she stood beside her bed for a moment, gripping her walker. And then she just collapsed onto the bed with this wail. And she cried, I hate myself. Mm. And I didn't say a word. I didn't feel anything other than maybe a, a sort of cold sense of satisfaction. But what I realized over time. You, we, you, when you say that, when you say a cold sense of satisfaction, you mean because you had, in a sense, disciplined her and she was 
as you might say to a child, learning our lesson. Yeah, yeah. Having it, it was react. like, yeah, yeah, e exactly. Um, but what I didn't fully, what I didn't get at all then, and it took me a long time to understand um, and get better about responding, was that when she said, I hate myself, she meant exactly that, that she hated who she was becoming. That, that she had, that she'd always been this vibrant, independent, vital, engaged person. And she couldn't be who she wanted to be anymore from the person who tutored women at the jail to the passionate Stanford fan. And not only that, she, she couldn't be the person who hosted. She wasn't the matriarch, you know, the family host anymore. And what I came to realize, and I think this is, can happen in caregiving, was that my mom's wail had been from the heart, <laughs> but my own was turning cold. And that can happen. You can get really angry. I used to get, have to get up many times during the night to help her. And I would, I, you know, you get exhausted. And that means you're not always at your best. I often have said that caregiving is like a heat-seeking missile. It finds your weaknesses and pierces them. And, and that, that happened to me on, on, on more than one occasion. Well, I think we should, we should, we should acknowledge too, as you do in your book, that, that uh, as of about 2005, which is going on 17 years ago, uh, you had your own diagnosis. And it was the disease that taking your father, would take your brother. Talk, talk a little about that, Dave. I know it, that's difficult and you don't want to focus on yourself in, in that way, but it's part of the story of what you were providing, both in the sense of, of sacrifice and then also in the sense of empathy and a little bit too what, what you're talking about in terms of the difficulties. Yes, I'd been diagnosed a couple of years when I moved in with my mom in 2007. And I know for many people, um, I'm sure at the time or since that seems like such a like a head scratcher like oh, right after you were diagnosed with Parkinson's or, or a few years after you moved in with your mom like what were you thinking and and the honest answer is I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't and then that's in part because I was doing so well and continue to do well as you know Ron Parkinson's is a condition that is immensely varied the old saying that if you've met one person with Parkinson's, you've met one person with Parkinson's <laughs> is true. My dad, my brother, and I all had very different versions of the disease. And as has been so true often in my life, I was, I was the lucky one. I was doing okay. And, and I, but I also will say, Ron, that um, I think one thing anybody who's been diagnosed with any kind of debilita debilitating condition feels is that you want to still be seen as someone who can do things, who can, who can fulfill their responsibilities, not just professionally, but make a difference in other ways too. And, and I, I, I mean, this probably sounds odd, but part of this, I think for me was also this feeling like I can do this. And then when I could, I felt pretty good about myself, you know, that I was this guy who had Parkinson's, but was doing this. I mean, that's, doesn't sound the greatest perhaps, but I think, I think that is part of it. And, and honestly, also, I was making my film about Parkinson's for the Frontline series. At oh, this, is called, this, is, this, is called, this is called Capturing Grace. Or no, I'm sorry, that's a different film. It's a different yeah, film. Yeah, this is the first film I made it's for first one. Called my father, really? my brother, and, and me. Right. Right. And um, I would subsequently make the other one. But um, it, it had, it was, in a sense, I felt like I was living out my family story. I was living with my mom who had cared for my dad. I was learning more about my dad. That's when I discovered those letters we referenced to and, and, um, and about his story. And, and in an odd way, it fit together. You'd think it would not have, but being a caregiver, being a filmmaker, um, being someone involved in telling a story, I guess, I felt like I was living out our family story in, in, in an important way. Just to pause for a moment, I believe we have some of the pictures that uh, we, we got set up. Somebody's in a position to share their screen and show us all about the picture of uh, Bill and Adelaide at their wedding in September of 1942. Uh, 
I think that, <laughs> I think we all that's have. Captain, that's Captain Bill Iverson uh, and and the former Adlai Schmidt in Gross Point, Michigan, in September of 1942. My dad had been in the army at that point by two years. And he had told my mom that there was no way they could get married unless he somehow got into officer's candidate school. My dad hated the army. And he, he actually took the fact that he was admitted into officer's candidate school as, as further, further testimony to the army's incompetence. So they would have made him an officer. Um, but he, he did, and then he was, saved up enough money to come back to Gross Point, but they were separated largely through the, through the war. Um, but they wrote to each other daily and my mom saved my dad's correspondence, which I discovered only after he died um, in a big box in his study. Um, and they were, as you mentioned, sort of remarkable, remarkable stories. He, he had a sense of humor. He did. I, I, not, not that all Stanford professors don't have a sense of humor, but uh, no, he, he did. I'll, 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 you know, my dad was this very professorial button down kind of guy, you know, very tucked in and gentle and kind, but as straight and arrow as you can imagine. So, so here's a letter I found from him uh, from the summer of 1940. So this is when he was first in the uh, army and he hadn't seen my mom for a long time. And he wrote her this. Dear Adelaide, be prepared to be trampled in the rush of my greeting when we meet next. I'm going to overwhelm you as no woman has ever been overwhelmed before. I think I'll shout and leap into the air, throw my hat down and stomp on it, seize you, fling you over my shoulder and gallop madly down the street to the hotel. Uh. There's a great deal. There's a there's a great deal of of that spirit. I think uh, throughout your book, a sense of of the continuation of that romance and the passion that they had for each other lives on in in the way that you care about your family. Um, did you did you ever did you ever in all of this consider the possibility of just finding a facility as 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 is so necessary and common uh, in many many instances. Uh, she did not have to have the rest of her life in her home there, so close to the campus where they lived forever. Um, what are your thoughts about that? What were your thoughts about that? You must have discussed it with Lynn. You must have discussed it with your brothers. No, I, I did. I mean, I really wanted to keep her at home, but it's very expensive. Um, and as our uh, assisted care facilities as well, but I wanted to do it as long as I could. And because I was there at nights and on the weekends, although I would get more help in time, we could limit our, our costs. But there's another important point to make about this, Ron, and then I'll come back to the question of, of the facility uh, option. One of the reasons why we could afford the wonderful care we did was because my folks had purchased a home in Menlo Park in 1950 for $15,000. One five. So, yeah, one five, zero, zero, zero. But obviously by 2007, it was worth just a little bit more than that. Um, and I could borrow against it and borrow against it and borrow against it to pay for our care. Um, and, 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 and yet in the end, we began to run out of the home equity line that we had. I got the bank to extend it once, but I couldn't get them to extend it again. Mm -hmm. And at that point, and my mom was at that point of 102 or three, I did start looking at facilities because my thought was, well, I could move my mom somewhere and then rent the house and that would, that would help pay for the care. Um, but then we were very fortunate that an old family friend of, of Means stepped in and called me and said, Dave, I know what's going on and I'm happy to help and I can loan you um, what's necessary to help keep Adelaide at home. Um, and then after she passes and you sell the house, you can repay me. But you know, I, this is what, what I think we need to awaken to. Ron. Um, that's not exactly a national elder care plan, right? Just make sure your parents bought a home in Menlo Park in 1950 and you'll be fine. But that's where we are. We do not have a plan for this. People mistakenly think, well, doesn't Medicare play, pay for home care? It does not. Medicaid 
or Medi-Cal in California can pay for home care, but that's large, not for home care, but for facility care. Um, but that's, you know, you have to meet strict income guidelines for that. Um, and, it, and, it, and there's a huge waiting list for that, which was part of the Build Back Better plan proposal that failed in Congress, as you well know, in December. That plan had $150 billion in it mm. for improving elder care, especially for the low income. We couldn't do it. Even though over two, nearly a quarter of a million people in elder care facilities and skilled nursing facilities died in the early part of the pandemic. So we have a long, long ways to go. So talk a little bit, uh, let, let's actually, let's make the transition now that I've, you have you've spoken about the caregivers and of course they're a big, big part of the book, Eileen and I, there were others, but, but, but these two obviously are uh, the pillars. Of, of the story. Uh, talk a little bit about how that all came to be. How did you find the people who made this all possible? Yeah. I first talked to an old friend of mine who'd gone through something similar. She recommended a particular home care agency, which I used, found a really lovely um, caregiver. Uh, and then six months later, one day, uh, Tila walked in and said, um, Dave, I'm going to have another baby. Can't continue. Um, and it was like this, darn, you know, is my reaction as opposed to saying, great. Um, and um, I had a, another friend who said, who had a recommendation. And if you get a recommendation for a caregiver from a friend you trust, it's like gold. And that was Mele, who was the first person we had for an extended length of time, a couple of years. And Mele Tafo was wonderful. She had this great engaging smile and laugh. Um, she was, as all of our caregivers were, a woman of color, an immigrant American, um, and she was fantastic. And you know, people often ask me, well, "What do you look for in a caregiver?" And of course, you want someone who has certain skills, who's had certain training, who's able to do uh, the, some of the what's needed when you're caring for someone. But most of all, you want someone who's loving. You want someone who's kind. You want someone who likes your mom, you know, and who your mom likes as importantly or more importantly. And I came to look at this when we sometimes interview prospective caregivers for that quality. And I, uh, my mom was always a part of those conversations and I would watch for how they reacted to each other. And if the prospective caregiver was paying attention to my mom, listening to my mom, talking to my mom, not just to me, not turning to me and saying, isn't she sweet? But talking to Adley, you didn't need to talk that way to Adley. <laughs> um, and Melly, in the end, what I felt was, what I would wind up asking myself is, okay, this person who I'm interviewing, will I feel glad when this person arrives at the front door or will I feel a little edgy and worry about what's gonna happen next? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is the former, then you're on the right track. Um, because not only does your mom's day depend on that, Mine did too. So that was the quality I always looked for. But these women, you know, they were just so amazing. And I, I, I want to name them, um, those principal caregivers we had, Mele Toffa, Eileen Khan, Sinai Latu, Ronette Morales. They were extraordinary. They had so much care, so much love, so much talent and skill. Um, English was their second, sometimes third language. They all worked two jobs. They all, one, Eileen was sleeping on the floor when she started with us at her parents' house because she lived 80 miles away in Tracy because of the high cost of living. And she'd sleep in, in her parents' apartment on the floor during the week while she worked one job and then came and worked for us. It opened my eyes, Ron, to an issue that I thought, like most Bay Area liberals, like, well, of course, I know all the, I, I have all the right views on immigration. It taught me things I never would have known otherwise. And Let me pause you just for one second. I'm sorry, Dave. I, I just really want to get a picture for people yes. in your mind. So, and I know we do have a photograph yeah. of, uh, of some of the women, and, and we want to just have that in mind as, as, as you talk. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Here we go. Tell us about this. This, this is 
Eileen on screen left and Sinai uh, on the right, standing in front of my mom's old house, the 1950 house, 1500 square foot ranch style house in Menlo Park, unchanged uh, since 1958. Everything about the house was the same. But Eileen, as you can tell, uh, was Muslim by her dress perhaps, and, and Sinai was Christian. I mentioned that because they were very devout Mm -hmm. And they looked at caregiving as a kind of calling um, and that they were in this work for that reason, that that's who they were called to be. And that is who they were. Um, I will always remember one night late in my mom's life, walking into my mom's bedroom late at night and I saw Eileen there. And I realized after a moment that she was wearing her prayer shawl and she was had her Muslim prayer beads, and she was whispering a, a prayer in Hindi. Um, and the next morning, I stepped back, and the next morning, I said to um, to Eileen um, that I was I was so touched by watching that, and that she was praying for my mom. And she just smiled and said, "Well." You know, Sinai actually taught me the Lord's Prayer, so sometimes I say that too. Um, they and they had a real bond and still do. Um, uh, perhaps we could show the other picture, Jessica, if we might, um, of um, uh, the other the other caregivers. If we can get that uh, ready, there's there's one more. Uh, there we yeah, so this is Ronette on the far left, Nicaraguan American, and then Eileen and Sinai, and me and my wife Lynn. And I wanted to show this because this was just taken three weeks ago in our backyard in Oakland. We had them over for lunch. There is still such a bond between us. Um, I, uh, Sinai and Lynn both went through breast cancer almost simultaneously together in their treatment. Um, they are, and always will be, so important um, to us. And I wanna just tell you one nice anecdote that happened recently. I gave a talk at a caregiving conference in Palo Alto and Lynn had the idea of, well, let's get Sinai there because she lived nearby. And so Sinai was able to get backup help for who she was caring for so that she could be there. And it was so sweet to give this talk with her and Lynn in the front row. And then after I was done with my talk, Ron, a couple of people brought books up and I thought, well, mm. they'd like me to sign the book. Well, they want me to sign the book. They wanted, they wanted Sinai to sign the book and Lynn to sign the book appropriately so as anyone who has read the book knows. Anyway, yes. the point is simply that um, they were remarkable. They, in so many ways, saved me. Well, I wanted to make the point um, that, that these stories are all explained in, in greater detail in the book. These are all the, the, the substance, the, the human tales of uh, this whole experience with all of these different caregivers over the, over the period of time and how they intersected with your life, as you mentioned the coincidence of, of the breast cancer diagnoses and treatments and just became the warp and woof of your own personal family life yeah. as well. Yeah. And if I could just make one other point about this, um, if I might run, because um, we were talking about the, the costs. By the end of my mom's life, our costs were approaching $15,000 a month because I took myself out of the caregiving equation the last year and a half and was just there two nights a week. And if it weren't for the good fortune of my mom's house and the good fortune of having this friend, that wouldn't have been possible. And we just, we just need to get so much better at this. And part of this is also the need and importance of paying people better. I could pay people better because of that gift, but many people cannot. And according to the Brookings Institution, the average wage for home health care provider like Mele and like Ronette and like Sinai and like Eileen in 2019 was $12 an hour. We have so far to go and yet we are so in need of people like those women. So 
I just want to ask everyone something today, if I can, which is the next time you overhear a conversation or hear someone talking about the need for skilled immigrants, that only people who come to this country are those who should have specialized skills, ask them what those skills are and why they're needed. Because of course we need specialized skills, but not just, you know, Bay Area technology skills. We need people who know how to rotate someone in bed so they won't get a bed sore. We, know, we need people who can talk gently and kindly and with love, even when they're exhausted, as I would sometimes fail in doing. We need people who have tenderness and awareness and who understand that age and getting old is part of life's bargain. You know, it's, I think about this, Ron, that we we were still so far from understanding that aging is, is part of life, not apart from life. And, and, and people like the ones we've been talking about understand that in a fundamental way that I think so many of us in this country have not. That certainly is one of the skills I assume you're referring to, but it's, it's perhaps a talent. I mean, it's perhaps a gift to be able to have that kind of understanding. And, and what advice do you have to people who perhaps don't have a friend who can give them the gold of a recommendation of a person they trust? Uh, how does one go about trying to find people with all yeah. of this to offer? Yeah, I, I think you start making connections. I think groups like Ashby Village and, and others, you start thinking about who's out there, who's possible. There are wonderful organizations like Avenidas in Palo Alto that is a wonderful elder care support organization and, and the, is one of the three organizations that it will receive the royalties from this book that can, can help make referrals. There's some good home care agencies that, that you can go to. And the advantage of an agency is that they will you know, provide you with someone who has these qualifications. There are downsides because an agency might charge you $30, $35 an hour, but the mm -hmm. caregiver is getting less than half of that. Mm -hmm. um, but there, you just have to put out a lot of different calls and connections. And, and then I think also it's, it's trusting your own instincts. If you interview someone and a little red flag is going off, well, it's going off for a reason. You know, pay attention to that because I, I, you know, I made mistakes. There wasn't everyone that was worked out just right. Um, we were extraordinarily lucky, but it takes it takes both work and good fortune and building that network so that when the time comes, um, th those people are available. Yeah, I did want to ask if you had batted a thousand. I mean, if you had just always had success with with all the people that you at one time or another may have tried. Yeah, we, we never had any really bad experiences um, or people who weren't trustworthy or unreliable. We had a couple of people who just couldn't handle my mom. You know? I mean, they, 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 the only thing my, my mom hated someone who was, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, would be condescending, but she also didn't like people who were docile, you know, <laughs> so, you know, and the, and, and, and she was a, it, it, one of the reasons why I knew instantly, Eileen, we met when my mom was hospitalized a second time, and she was a, 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 a certified nursing assistant in a rehab place where my mom was, and I knew the first time she worked in the room that, that she and Adelaide would be a fair fight, you know, it would be, an equal, it would be an equal match, so it's some of that. It's finding, it's finding, you know, who can contend with whom. Well, well speaking just for, just to, again, get, getting back to one of the chief delights of, of your book, which is getting to know Adelaide. Um, we have a picture, I believe, of one of the golden moments of, of her life. <laughs> uh, she was a lifetime fan of Stanford sports. And I can tell you that takes a certain amount of perseverance uh, it, it hasn't always been a rewarding experience, but she was as loyal as loyal can be. And when, and when, how old was she? How old was she at this point, uh, David, when she got to throw out the first pill? This yeah, is this is, this is at age 94. She threw out the first pitch at a Stanford baseball game because I, I, I sort of did this calculation that my folks together had been 
to probably well over a thousand Stanford games together. And then my mom went to another three or 400 after my dad died. And I just thought it would be a nice way to sort of honor her as a fan. And, and so her first pitch was not exactly the high hard one, you know, it was, um, it was about a 10 foot toss to the, to the underhand toss to the Stanford catcher who was grinning his, his ears off. And then afterwards, she went around and shook hands and high-fived every member of the team, which is what you see here. And at the end, also the coaches. And one of the coaches then took her aside and said, you know, Adelaide, um, we're going to need another reliever later in the season. And, I, and I, it looks like you've got a pretty good arm. It, uh, as you know, Ron, it might have been nice to have had her in Omaha last, last week. <laughs> well, well, but... but Amber come, didn't make it, but. Just imagine the, the thrill of, of all of that uh, yeah. for her, but also for all the guys, all, for all the, the players, the coaches, the other people involved. They certainly had seen her in the stands over the years. She was an icon, and uh, that was a huge part of her life. And so when you talk about somebody being ready to deal with her, I mean, that, that we don't want to give the impression that, that she was in some sense or another unreasonable, cantankerous, et cetera. She was spirited, high spirited. That's very clear in the book. And, uh, and she had climbed up and done a great deal with her life when that was not assumed of everyone who got married and, and had a family. Uh, she was a pioneer in a lot of respects and, and lived into an era in which uh, she could see things had changed a great deal. Well, I think that's absolutely right. And as part of what I had to learn over time, Ron, with dementia, she had these extraordinarily insightful things she would say, but sometimes she would just say things that were confused or wrong. And, and it took me a long, I'm someone who, you know, has way too great a tendency to want to be right and to make sure you know that I'm right and then to further explain to you why I'm right which is a useless attribute when you're living with someone with dementia. And, um, and I would too often correct her. And the example I wanna give is that I remember she would say on occasion that she'd gone to law school and that, that wasn't true. Um, and I, so I would just say, mom, you didn't go to law school. The, the, the better answer would be speaking to the character you just described would be to say something like, well, mom, tell me, tell me about that. What, 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 what interested you about the law? You know, was it because you someday maybe thought you'd run for political office? Tell me about that. Because, you know, my mom would have made a hell of a politician. You know, the, the, the San Mateo Board of Supervisors would not have been the same if she had, had run and been elected. But there's, there's, I write about this some in the book, that part of the challenge, I think, as a caregiver is to understand the truth beneath the words that, and to look for that. You know, if my mom said one day, as she did, that a caregiver had left her in the bathroom for hours and hours, I knew that wasn't true. But what I came to understand was that the caregiver had helped her into the bathroom, came back a minute later and my mom had dozed off and she let her rest for a while and then woken her up and my mom was startled. Well, did, was she left alone in the bathroom for hours and hours? No, but did it feel like that to her? I think so, you know, all of a sudden it was like, what's happening? Where am I? Someone must have left me here for hours. So I think one of the great challenges is to try to put ourselves in that person's um, skin and, and, and understand that they're looking out at this scary new world where they are not who they once were. And to try to hear that truth and respond to that rather than to correct that person or to say what I think is the most unhelpful phrase of all. And I said it way too many times, Ma, don't you remember? There's no point in that. It's like saying to someone with Parkinson's, you know, uh, like saying to my, my brother, uh, Peter, can't you, can't you just quit shaking your hand? Um, you know, can't you just stop your hand from shaking? It's useless. And so I think from that experience of dementia, um, we can learn so much. I learned so much. Did I ever get it exactly right? No, I did not. 
Um, but I think, I think therein is also one of the great rewards of, of caregiving, um, that I am very grateful um, that I had the opportunity to, to experience. Well, babe, I think that's on every page of, of, of this book, that, that sensibility, that sensitivity to both your mother's experience. You know, we, you're not a saint in the book. And, and I don't I want anybody to, to, to think that you'll be nominated for that status. Uh, you know, you come through as a very human fellow. But, uh, but the sense in which you just were describing your mother's stages and, and, and all of us are experiencing some stage or another of aging and uh, being reminded of it by the people that we're around and so forth and trying to come to some sort of terms with it and to find the kind of human story that you have here, not only in terms of your mother and her journey, but in terms of your own and then that of Eileen and Sinai and others. Uh, I think that's really quite an achievement. And, um, and I enjoyed very much having a chance to, to preview it and then read it when it came out in hardcover, my wife as well. Uh, her mother lived to be almost as old as Adelaide, 102 uh, in San Francisco. And, uh, and I think went through many of the same kinds of experiences. So you have a universal truth here, David. And uh, I, I, for one, thank you for sharing it with us. And I, and I, and I also um, want to open this up. We, I know we have some questions waiting in the chat and, and I wanna give people a chance to, to ask questions. But before, before we do that, there, there are a couple of parts of the book. I know you read at the very beginning and, and, and we have some several excerpts that would make good reading, but, but there are, there, there's one in particular that I, I think would, would be really uh, meaningful before we even move on to the questions. If, if, you, uh, if you would, it's on page 201. It's uh, the story about the last Christmas. Yeah, thank you, Ron. Um, yeah, the, by way of setup for this, I just wanna mention that the last two years of my mom's life, she was largely uh, bedridden. Um, and one thing that was so remarkable, again, a testimony to Eileen in particular, um, was that her skin was always beautiful. And if you want a way of measuring the care that someone's receiving, well, look at their skin um, because skin care is so crucial because of bed sores. And my mom's skin almost until the day she died was perfect. That's the kind of care that we were fortunate enough to receive. But in the last year in particular of her life, um, she was very restless and anxious, I think, and, and had a hard time communicating, though she was always still the center of all of our attention, even if she wasn't able to communicate, she still sort of controlled the room. Um, but she was restless, she would kick at the bed rails because she wanted to get out, you know, she wanted to get out and do things. And that always worried me because I wasn't sure she would ever come to any kind of, of peace. Um, but on this particular, at this particular moment, this was our last Christmas that she would, she would be alive. Um, and when I walked into her, her bedroom, I had a, a different experience from winter stars. I knew right away that on this December night, she was in a different place. There wasn't any restlessness. She just seemed quiet and calm. She looked to be quite remarkably at peace. We just sat there for a long time holding hands and I felt a wave of tenderness come over me. After a while, my mom looked at me and she said in a voice that was soft, but only slightly slurred, you look wonderful, she said. And I told her that she did too. And, and then I said, we make a good pair. And she smiled and said, what a pair. And then we sat, my hand on top of hers, 
just sitting together, nothing more. And then she turned her head to me and said, I feel lucky. She said it with more clarity than anything I'd heard her say in recent months. And I told her that I felt lucky too, lucky for all that she'd added to my life and to the lives of those around her, and that I would always remember what she taught me. And then she said it again, I feel lucky. And so I asked her if she could tell me why. And there was a long pause. And then she looked at me with eyes as bright as winter stars and said, because there's love all around. On that Christmas night, I felt something I hadn't experienced before. That while my time with my mom was still unfinished, our journey was now complete. We had endured our bursts of anger and frustration, but over time, our deep and abiding connection had always held. And while the currents of time and age had taken us into territory we'd never imagined, we'd kept traveling. And that journey had carried us to our truest destination as mother and son. It had brought me to the bedside of someone I loved so that I could hear the deepest of all truths, that there is love all around. Thank you, Dave. And, and thank you for this story and, and for sharing it. Um, we, I don't have questions from our listeners and we'd like to uh, give the, them an opportunity to ask those questions. Now we can do that from, from uh, the chat, but I think someone is ready to actually bring us some of those questions. And is there anything else that you wanted to add, Dave? Maybe we could do that uh, after we've taken some questions. No, that sounds fine. Let's turn it over to Sigrid to pose questions for us. Sigrid. Thank you, Sigrid. Thank you so very much, Ron. And in particular, Dave, I mean, for this very personal and um, touching story. And I mean, that Christmas story, I mean, it just <laughs> goes to my heart, I have to say. I mean, really, thank you so very much. Um, yeah, we have a few questions here. Uh, the first one was, um, it's actually a question you already answered, but I will mention it again. What went into your decision to keep your mom living at home instead of moving her to a senior care residence? I don't know if you want to still say something about that, or I mean, you said already. Yeah. No, I, I would like to add one thing at least, and, and Ron, from your own experience, you may want to add something too, but I, while I was determined to try to keep my mom at home as long as I could, it's what I wanted, and, and more importantly, it's what she wanted. I don't ever want to presume that this is an option for everyone, or that it's the only way this can be done. Um, this happened at a moment in my life where I could make this choice. You know, I was 59, my career was well established. It was, I was working full time, but I had a lot of flexibility. I was single at the time. There were a lot of reasons why this worked. I wouldn't have done it 10 years earlier. I probably wouldn't have done it 10 years later. And it's not possible for everyone, especially if for people whose parents live a long ways away. So I just want to say that because I don't, I never would want to come across like I'm on some, some you know, um, trying to, on my, my speaking um, pedestal, uh, giving this talk, because it's, it's, it's not that. And I think there are many fine assisted living facilities and nursing care facilities. I would watch for skin when you go in and look at them. Um, and they can be just as expensive uh, too, actually. The best place I saw was every bit as expensive as what I, we were paying at home. Um, but um, for me, it was a possible, um, a possibility. I know that's not true for everyone. There are quite a few questions about caregivers versus agent, I mean, caregivers hired personally or versus an agency. So um, your, your um, opinion about it, the caregivers, were they hired through an agency or by you, the ones that you use? I did both. Um, uh, Mele, our first uh, major caregiver, meaning the one who was with us for a, a couple of years, um, uh, was independent. 
uh, uh, Tila, the first person we had though for six months was great and then left because she was having another child was from an agency. Sanai, who was with us um, for a long time was a wonderful caregiver who had this sparkling personality who could make Adelaide laugh, which is actually a great, great attribute. Um, she was from an, an, an agency. I think one thing worth remembering, Sigrid, and it, every single one of the women I've mentioned had two jobs um, to, make, to make ends meet. Um, they worked two jobs. So they were all working 16 hours a day, basically. Ronette left us in part because she just couldn't do it anymore. She couldn't work that long. Mele left us because she wanted to grow her, her family. We have to be aware of those circumstances too. I, the advantage of, of hiring someone independently is you can pay them a decent wage and they get all of that wage. That is not the case through an agency. The agency advantage is that they have pre-interviewed people. They're making sure that these people have the right um, uh, licensing, they're bonded. So if you worry about what if this person steals from my mom and that your mom is a thousand miles away, there are some advantages there. And there's some good, there's some good agencies. In the end, you just want someone who, who can provide the kind of care I've described. And I think that can happen from either source. Um, you mentioned you were able to pay good. What do you suggest is a good wage for this work versus the average of $12 that you mentioned? That was the average in 2019. It's certainly much higher than that in the Bay Area now. Um, uh, I will say that I, I spent 25 uh, an hour, um, but that was, you know, that's also now, you know, um, what, six years ago. Um, I don't know, honestly, what would be the right amount now, but I'm sure any agency is going to charge 30 to 35. Yeah, I can tell you. I mean, I had to use an agency lately. It was between 32 and 40, actually, now yeah. the agencies. Um, how do Western European countries, for instance, deal with the need for caregivers? Is there a model we could aspire to? Well, this is where I'm going to turn it over to Ron because he's smarter about all things uh, uh, that have to do with foreign policy and policy in general than I am. The models are great in terms of what they can provide. Uh, they're not so dispositive when it comes to getting there because the European models are built on a much longer experience of government taking responsibility for this kind of thing. Um, as Dave mentioned, there was an enormous amount of money in the Build Back Better package that was kicked around last fall and winter and eventually did not get enacted. Uh, I think we all know that story, but uh, that very large overall package trillions of dollars really over a 10 year period uh, included $150 billion for the kind of care we're talking about, although it was focused primarily on the people who need the help most, people who would be either Medicaid eligible or close to it. So that would not be a solution for everyone either because you, you may very well have, especially in California, an income that uh, uh, looks pretty high in terms of a government scale it may not buy nearly as much as it once did, and it may not do so in the Bay Area. But uh, that is something we have to, that's something we have to contend with. And of course, it didn't happen. I mean, we didn't get that $150 billion. So that, which would not have been a panacea by any means, but it would have been a help. <laughs> Certainly. That didn't happen. And frankly, I don't think the prospects for putting the, the big pieces of that back together this year are all that great. Obviously, a big political concern at the moment is inflation. So having government spend more money, even over a 10-year period, uh, is more difficult even than it was a year ago, six months ago. But with all that discouragement, um, I would still say that over a three to five-year period, the sheer importance of this and the universality of it as it affects virtually every family we'll bring it back and bring it back again and again. And that eventually, if we believe in democratic uh, politics at all, democratic Republican form of government where eventually the will of the people does have some impact, I think this is going to rise and rise on the priority list of the will of the people. And for that reason, while I can't be sanguine about the next year or two, 
um, in the years ahead, this is going to be a much larger policy priority than it's ever been before. And maybe we'll even approach something like a European model in time. And if I could just add one thought beyond the Western European examples, and I alluded to this before, but I think one of the things that many immigrants can bring to this country is a different understanding of, of what caring for the old means and the way that can be part of one's family rather than apart from family. And, and that I remember conversations I would have sometimes with Eileen and Sinai in particular, who would say that when they first came to this country, they were like, what is, what is this? You know, why, why aren't people caring for their parents? And, and as I just mentioned, that isn't always possible. But I think that um, cultural approach and, and sort of sense of, of what it means to be a family is also a great gift um, that people new to this country provide. Next question was, how long did your mom remain mobile, get around on her feet? She was able to use a walker until she was 103. Um, so we would use the wheelchair, you know, whenever we went to um, uh, Stanford games, for example. And I, I you know, I, I know for a Berkeley audience, Ron and I are spending way too much time talking about that other university. But um, so, you know, it's not like we didn't use a wheelchair. We used a wheelchair a lot. I would wheel her downtown so that we could we could go uh, see things downtown and get a cup of coffee at Pete's. Uh, but she could still get around the house with a walker until she was 103. And what happened was she was, Eileen was with her at the time. Eileen was uh, in the bathroom taking a shower. And my mom uh, managed to get up out of where she was sitting um, the, wheel, the, the walker uh, was not right beside her and she fell and broke her collarbone. And from that point on, she, she was not able to, to walk again, though she wasn't fully bedridden for another six months or so after that. So the next, um, the next one is actually not really a question. It's, it's a comment from our own Veronica from Ashby Village. And she said, I think that your melee is the same melee who cared for me and my broken leg this past December, a loving Tonga, Tonga Buonap. Could be. Mele Tofa is indeed from Tonga. Um, Mele is Mary in, in Tongan, as I understand it. So I'm sure there are a few Meles around, but um, Mele Tofa was, um, is uh, an extraordinary person and, and I'm sure provided exactly that kind of care. Any additional routes you'd suggest for those who cannot financially keep her at home? Any new perspectives? Well, this is where we need to grow. I mean, a lot of the money in the Build Back Better plan, if it ever comes back, would help in this um, circumstance. I think extending the reach of, of, of um, the village movement, Ashby Village, San Francisco Village, where, you know, the village programs everywhere, providing support, because sometimes I think people wind up thinking, well, I've got to, you know, I, 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 I need help, but someone just, being able to take me to the grocery store um, would be, you know, those sorts of things can be useful in extending the amount of time people are at home. I think it's about advocacy in the end. I think that we really need to advocate on this question. Ashby Village has an active elder action component that's terrific. Um, and I think that's what we need to do, you know, as with so many other issues, as we have learned, greatly in just the last week. There are so many things that require our advocacy. And those of us who have the time to write postcards and make phone calls need to do it. Um, and this is one of the issues that requires that. You, you know, I would just add to that there are programs, there are people who are attempting to find ways to pair people who need visitation or trips to the grocery store or help getting to the grocery store with younger folks. And in, in some cases, you know, quite young teenagers, uh, people who have perhaps little sense that they have spare time, but people who do have time, that don't have jobs, that don't have families yet. 
And it is a wonderful experience for all concerned to have people who are separated by two or even three generations get to know each other in this way. It's such a wonderful thing for the young people to experience the humanity of their forebears that uh, I just, you know, I just think that that's a, it's not a solution. It, it's, it's not a, it's not the sort of thing where you can expect it to, to happen everywhere overnight. But, but if it could be more of a focus for policy to find ways for volunteerism to pick up more of this, of this human resource problem. Another question was, did you ever try to obtain someone to live in? Great question. Um, I did, um, it happened almost by accident in some ways. Um, after Eileen uh, had been with us for um, several years, um, so my mom at this point would have been pushing 100, um, maybe at 100, and I was still uh, trying to um, work, was still hosting forum on Fridays, um, still finishing one particular uh, film project, uh, and I needed to go I needed to sometimes be able to, I was doing one film that was in New York and some of the filming would, could be done when I wasn't there, some I had to be there for. I would sometimes take a red eye out to New York, film all day and then come back that, that night. And then it finally occurred to me that I had a ready-made solution, at least in part, because Eileen, as I mentioned, was sleeping on the floor at her parents' apartment during the week while she worked her other day job and then would come with us. And I finally said, Eileen, do you want to move in? Just move in. Um, and she did. And so she was there. I still did nights because she had to get up at five in the morning to go to her other job. But it provided me with a built-in solution when I did need to go away overnight. And gradually I added to that over time. Sanai wound up taking over one day of the weekend, then two days over the weekend. So I did add it piece by piece um, over, over time. <clears throat> Any new perspectives about financial aspects for care at home or in a facility? I mean, we already kind of like talked a little bit about that. So, um, but the new was written in capital letters. So um, I know I wish there was something new. Um, and, <laughs> and I know that, um, again, the Elder Action Group at Ashby Village is active in, in uh, advocating for certain pieces of legislation. Um, that are now uh, in front of the California legislature. Some of these things may happen on a on a state by state basis. You know, we've seen, in my opinion, some not very good things happening that are going to happen now uh, on a state by state basis, whether that's guns or or women's rights. Uh, but I think the opposite model can be true, and there may be some opportunities for some individual states to take action in a way that, that begin to provide um, more support. Do, Ron, any, any thoughts from your end on what you're seeing around the country? I wish I had something really to add. Um, the, I don't see a new dimension. I don't see something that's really uh, a, a, a new deep well of resources. What is the name of a local organization that pairs youth who can help seniors with needs? Well, that is a wonderful question. And I wish I, I, uh, I, wish I had a Bay Area name for you. I'm familiar with some here in Washington DC area where I live, but, but I, will have to, I will have to merely promise you a little research and see what I can find. But I will see if I can do that. If you, if you will, uh, just uh, you, can, you can write to me directly as relving, R Elving at npr.org, don't forget it's org on the end. And I'm sure there are resources that we can look into here that Ashby Village can happen and I can and I can also try to make the same effort to, to find organizations that do that. Yeah, I, I, I fear that to a large degree, it's still notional that, that it is certainly not something that, you know, you're gonna see every time you go to the grocery store, but, uh, but it is a good idea. And I think that it, uh, as the need grows, and, and, and as the, the supply of, of government money is as limited as it is, that we, we really need to be as creative as possible about making some of these things happen. Um, I actually have a question for you too, um, Dave. Um, 
you talked about that cold sense of satisfaction um, after that incident. I mean, when you went to dinner and with the relatives and friends and you took her home, you know, like you said, like a child almost, you know, that misbehaved and then she was collapsing on the bed and you said there was this cold sense of satisfaction. I mean, how long did that last? I mean, that feeling, I mean, because I think everybody who who is a caretaker, I mean, they know that this kind of a feeling, you know, I mean, it, you're so angry at the moment, but then there's this other feeling coming in the feeling guilty about that. So I'm just wondering how you. Yeah, are... no, I, 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 I didn't come to the, the later understanding of maybe what my mom meant by saying, I hate myself until sometime much later. Um, but I felt regret, you know, I felt like I hadn't acted um, well. And, and, um, and I, I remember feeling a little torn, like, do I apologize? And if so, what for? I mean, I, I felt like my anger was sort of justified. Um, but I, I did, and, you know, I, I did um, say that I was, I was sorry the next morning. I didn't, I didn't feel good for very long at all. And that would happen on other occasions. That's the thing, you know, you, you think that you learn from your mistakes and I did, but that didn't mean I wasn't capable of repeating those mistakes, you know. Um, I remember it's a story I tell in the book once and I don't even remember what I got mad at my mom about. Maybe she was just saying the same thing again and again and I just blew up, I, I don't know. But I remember blowing up and she starting to cry. And my reaction was to say, go ahead and cry. And then I stomped out of the room and slammed the door like a teenager. And I went into the garage, which was right next to the kitchen of my mom's house. And it was raining. And I could hear the rain falling on the roof. And I remember just letting out this breath and thinking, who am I becoming? And then walking back into my mom's kitchen and sitting down beside her. And then I was the one who burst into tears. And it was my mom who reached out and said to me, don't, don't cry, David, don't cry. Again, you know, you get it all as a caregiver, you get great joy and you get, and you get tears, but you also get forgiveness. Um, one of the great gifts my mom gave me was that she believed in me. And towards the end of our, her life, um, when we had to make some choices about what we would continue to treat and what we would not and all of that, it was always of great comfort to me to know that my mom believed in me and trusted me, um, which is, you know, perhaps the greatest gift a, a parent can ever give a child, even one who was now in, in, uh, in, in his 60s. <laughs> um, so I never felt good for long, um, but I, I would learn from it over, over time. But I had to learn and learn and learn again. Um, did your mom actually um, ever get any successful medical treatment for her agitation and ordinariness? Such a good question. You know, my mom was someone who was sort of in, impervious to both pain and medication. You know, she um, she never. I mean, she she tried to get out of her hospital bed during one of her hospitalizations because she wanted to go. You know, she wanted she had stuff to do, um, and she fell, and but didn't seem any the worse for wear. It wasn't until weeks later we discovered that she'd broken her ankle. Um, that was kind of typical Adelaide. Um, and the same, unfortunately, was true with medication. You could, we tried any number of combinations of medication for, for anxiety and sleeplessness and, and depression. 
and they never seemed to make much difference. The hospice docs were great at trying different things and titrating this and that, um, but I have to say we never had great success. But of course, everyone's different, and there have been new advances probably in, in medications for those conditions um, since then, but we did not have great success. Um, the next question is actually, is a, in my opinion, a really good question. Talk about rebuilding your life after extensive caregiving. Mm. Well, you're, everyone's sick of me saying this, but again, I will start by saying that I was, I was really lucky um, because of, of Eileen and Sanai, Ronette and Male and others, but also because of my brothers and sisters-in-law and, and my wife, Lynn. Um, you know, Lynn and I got married late in my time as a caregiver because we finally figured after being together 20 years, well, maybe maybe that would be an appropriate thing to do. Um, so I had a lot that was already going for me. Um, I don't think I was traumatized or, or by the way some people are. And, I will also say though, you know, I think it's different to care for a parent than it is for a spouse. I think caring for a spouse is so much harder in some ways as caring for an adult child would be as well. There's just a little bit of distance between you and your parent um, that I think makes that, that different. Um, and I was also lucky during the time I was a caregiver that I, I could get away, I could run. I took up long distance running. Um, to get away, honestly, and to be alone. I love the, the, the solitary nature of running. Um, but so I was able to pick up, I guess, and continue. Sorry for this being such a long answer, but I wanna say one more thing, which is I did get to the point after eight, plus years of being my mom's caregiver, where I just knew, it followed one night when I got angry with my mom, that I had to, I had to, I had to make some fundamental changes. And that's when I first started sleeping out of my dad's study at the other end of the house. And, and Eileen and Sanai were taking over the, those nights. And I will always remember being able to close the door for the first time. It's the first time I'd closed the door in that house for, for eight years. Um, you get to that point. I have an old saying, which is that all caregivers need more help than they think they do. And all caregivers come to that realization later than they should. And that was true for me. It's true for almost everyone. And I was just extraordinarily fortunate to get the support that I did and eventually be able to step back so that I could be more a son again and, and less a care provider. Nice. <laughs> That's a question from a participant. Did you ever spend time in Gross Point? <laughs> <laughs> I took my mom. Um, later before I was living with her when she was, you know, probably only 90 um, uh, to a trip back to see um, some of her old haunts. Uh, so we went to Detroit and we went to Gross Point. I have a picture of her standing in front of Pierce Junior High where she met my dad. Um, and she used to love to tell stories about, about Pierce Junior High and what a great school it was and how when she first met my dad, she had no time for him. She just thought he was this loud mouth down the hall because he was still this radio guy. My dad had performed in the early days of the Lone Ranger and the Green Hornet on the radio and uh, didn't take long for her to whip him into shape. But um, uh, initially she couldn't stand him. Um, and, and so that was my only visit to Gross Point. Um, could long-term care insurance cover in-home care? It may be too late for us, but younger relatives may start thinking about this option. It can and, and does. I know people who have been able to call upon long-term insurance to care insurance to, to pay uh, for a spouse's care in particular. So yes, it can. The problem of course with long-term care insurance is that it's quite expensive and it can easily wind up costing more than it, it provides depending on when you start using it. 
There also are, uh, at least there were at the time that I looked into it, requirements uh, such that I could not get long-term care insurance because of my Parkinson's diagnosis. Now this was pre-Obamacare and, and maybe Ron, you might know that that pre-existing condition would now not affect me in applying for long-term care insurance, um, but it, it definitely can pay for, for in-home care. Um, there's another question about caregivers, how to find caregivers. You already answered that. I mean, in a way, how to find caregivers without going through an agency, which adds cost. But the next part of the question, I think, is interesting. How to assess the excellence of a caregiver, signs and warning signs to look for? Again, I think the most important thing is to really assess how the two relate to one another. Now, it may be that perhaps this person is going to care for someone who no longer has the ability to communicate. In my mom's case, she could pretty much always communicate until the last year and a half or so of her life. Um, but watch for that. Do they actually get along? That's the thing that matters. How do they relate to each other? Is the person focused on her and not on you? You don't want someone who's all about pleasing you. You want someone who's about pleasing the person being cared for. I think asking for references and, and really, um, but you know, it's not unlike, you know, if you're picking a preschool for your kid, it's, it's paying attention, it's seeing, it's observation and listening to whatever warning signs there might be. For me, it was things like the person looking at me rather than at my mom or not having any sense of humor. A sense of humor is so fantastic to have in a care provider. Um, someone who's, capable, who can let things roll off their back. My mom could be hard on Eileen and Sinai, Mele and Ronette. She could make them, and I think did make each of them cry. Um, but they also could let that go and walk right back in and say, so Adelaide, what would you like to do now? Um, those are hard qualities to discern, but I, I think that's what you really want to look for. Um, one question about your mom. Do you think she really wanted to keep on living in this condition? Yeah. This gets into a whole other area that we may or may not have time to discuss. My mom was someone who is very clear about not wanting to live too long for most of her life. They filled out an advanced health directive. My parents did when they were in their late 70s. And when my mom was in her mid 90s, we updated it and we went to an attorney because my brother and I, my older brother and I had joint responsibility for certain things, um, including um, healthcare and, and, um, and my older brother was actually the executor for the will. And it made sense to all of us, including my brother, that that go to me, given what was going on in my living with her. And the attorney assessed um, where my mom was and said, I'm, and had me step away so she could ask my mom what she really wanted and redid her healthcare directive. And she was like, no, of course I don't want to be intubated. No, I don't want extraordinary. I don't want any of this. But late in life, by that I mean 101, two, from there on, the sentence she said the most, two sentences. One was, what are we going to do now? That was really her favorite sentence. And the other was, I don't want to die. And, and um, she didn't. Um, and I never really knew if she was ready. Um, there were times when she would say things like, I'm afraid I'll never get out of here. And I would say, get out of where? And she just said, never, ever here. And I didn't know quite what she meant. It'd be tempting to think that she was afraid she'd never escape this life. I think when she said, I'm afraid I'll never get out of here, she met her hospital bed. She was afraid she'd never get out of there and be able to do things again. So yes, she did, she did want to live. Um, and that's a tough one, because I think we all have to think about that. And we all have to think about writing down for our own children or spouses what we want that's not just a checked box on an advanced care form or a physician's order for life-sustaining treatment, but to really say, here's what I value in life. And if I still have the opportunity to do those things, whether it's a hike in the woods or go to a Stanford game, then yeah, I wanna live. 
But if I no longer can do those things, then not so much. We need to be able to write down and express those things for our loved ones because it's tricky once someone gets older and can no longer, it's which person do you want to honor? Do I want to honor the Adelaide who never wanted extraordinary care? Or do I want to honor the Adelaide who says, I don't want to die? You can get into, and, and those things take a lot of thought and heart and discussion to try to, to, try to answer. Um, so that's a, that's a big question and an important one. And it, I do write about that some in, in the book. One question is if you have any personal personal experience with life term insurance policies. I mean, we talked about it briefly. If you personally have any experience, with I, it. I don't. So, and then there is um, a comment by our own Roberta Pressman, um, who is actually uh, chairing the healthier aging. A part of Ashby Village and she says Ashby Village social care team maintains lists of reputable home care agencies and individual providers. We also maintain screening questionnaires for providers. Individual providers have been harder to recruit since the pandemic. That's great. That's a great resource but it is something that we all need to be thinking about. And people have asked me sometimes, well, do you have your own care plan in place and all of that stuff? And the answer is no. You'd think after all this, I would have it all figured out, but I still, like all of us, have a lot to think through and plan for in that regard. Yeah, and I think that brings us to the end of our questions. So um, thank you very much again, Dave and, and Ron. And, um, on to, um, on to Rochelle now. Before Rochelle begins, I just would like to leave everyone with one last image of my mom, because I mentioned that she was someone who sometimes could be extraordinarily um, articulate and, and say things in ways that um, I, I'd never really um, thought about before. And once when we were sitting outside, um, we were sitting together, and she had a blanket over her. And I said to her, it's pretty out here today, isn't it, mom? And she said, I like what's covering me. And I said, do you mean your blanket? And she said, I mean the sky. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. It, it certainly is. And uh, <clears throat> I want to thank you, Dave and Ron, for this very moving exchange about caregiving. So many of us are here today um, who are or have been or will be family caregivers. And I wanted to thank all of you for being brave and kind enough to take on this labor of love. It also takes great courage to accept what is perhaps as hard or even harder, facing the likelihood that someday, as Dave said earlier, we're going to be needing care ourselves. More on that shortly. Often as elder caregivers, we feel invisible. What we do is something that pretty much stays inside our homes, particularly during the pandemic. So we are especially glad that Dave and Ron have helped us um, by exposing the heartwarming and heartbreaking daily challenges and rewards of caregiving. And that both of them have acknowledged Dave's important partners, the extraordinary essential workers whom his family employed. Their considerable skill and kindness were key to Dave's mother's well-being, to Adelaide Iverson, and to her son Dave's well-being as well. I also want to acknowledge another invisible team, though. Um, it takes a village to produce a meaningful arts and culture event like today's, which is why, although our arts and culture events are free, we hope that if you were as moved by today's presentation, including the questions and the answers as I was, you'll consider a donation to help us continue to offer events like this one. And in addition to thanking Dave and Ron, I'd like to thank the members of the arts and culture group 
Sigrid Duisberg for the beautiful job of managing the questions and answers, to Irene Marcos, Rondi Saslow, and Betty Webster. And thanks too to our new executive director, Bab Freiberg. Your warm welcome to Ashby Village set the stage for, stage for today's presentation. And thank you also to Ashby, Ashby Village's staff members, Sharice Hanshaw and Jessica Sterling for your communications and technical support. Special thanks though to arts and culture honorary member, Ashby Village member, Joanne Carter, who introduced us to Dave Iverson. And I wanna underscore again, as Dave said earlier, that he's donating all the royalties from the sale of Winter Stars to support Parkinson's research and elder care. So to buy a copy, you can visit his website, which we have up in our chat, which is www.daveiversonauthor.com. When we hear poignant stories like Dave's and his mother Adelaide's, well, we're, we're Ashby villagers. So we wanna do something. So I approached Lindsay Imai Hong, the California Executive Director of Hand in Hand, the national organization of domestic employers and their employees. Lindsay had the privilege of a history of working with Marsha Friedman, Ashby Village's late visionary board member. Along with me, Marsha was the co-chair and co-founder of this arts and culture series and also of Elder Action that Dave has mentioned, where Marsha chaired our long-term services and support, LTSS task force. So thinking of Marsha, as I often do, I want us to hear a few words on video from Lindsay Imehang today, including one step that we hope you will take after leaving here this afternoon. So Jessica, a few words from Lindsay on video, please. At Hand in Hand, we organize the employers of house cleaners, home care workers, and nannies to recognize that our homes are people's workplaces, as well as to partner with domestic workers to improve working conditions, pay and benefits for domestic workers, and to strengthen our long-term care safety net so we can all afford the care that we need. Mr. Iverson's story reminds us of how little systemic support there is for families in need of care. There is no long-term care safety net beyond Medi-Cal, leaving most Californians to figure out care on their own. Further, the inequities of our care system reflect and reinforce societal inequities based on race and gender, class, immigration status, and disability. So what's needed? What's needed is a long-term care system that truly cares for all of us. And that's gonna require substantial and sustained investments in our long-term care safety net, as well as protections, real protections, better pay and benefits for the long-term care workforce. And to win those things, we need to build the power, the grassroots power of those most directly impacted. And we're holding a forum on July 8th where we're gonna outline the policy pathways towards universal long-term services and supports, as well as actions people can take to help us to make progress along those policy pathways. And we hope that you'll join us. And so what I wanted to say after this is that we will shortly be sending you the precise information about when, where, and how you can attend this July 8th forum and everyone who attended today's arts and culture event will be getting that specific information. And we hope to see you there. I also hope that some of you will come forward to help Elder Action expand our own LTSS task force. Our goal is to build support for a California state funded long-term services and support benefit. So if you're interested, please put your name and email address in the chat today and or attend our next Elder Action General meeting on Tuesday, July 19th at 2 p.m. Elder Action is reaching out around long-term support and services now to groups of California elders, groups of caregivers, as well as people with disabilities or with children who have chronic conditions 
we're reaching out to form a close-knit coalition whose members cannot be pitted against each other to defeat this, like opponents of initiatives like long-term services and support often try to do. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Before I pass the baton on to Jessica, I want to remind you to watch your inbox for flyers for our fall arts and culture event, which we hope will be a hybrid that offers you both the chance for coming together in person and the closed captions in the comfort of your home that Zoom offered us today. So do RSVP early and bring a friend. And now on to you, Jessica. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, everybody. Um, it was great to hear from Dave and Ron always. And I just wanted to, um, I wanted to wish everybody a great day, great rest of your weekend. Thanks for joining us.